You might be opening your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. In just a moment, we're going to reference a passage in verses 28 and 29. But before we do that, I'd like to invite you to pray with me the prayer that we offer every time that we enter into the study of the wonderful theme of grace. The prayer will appear on the screen. I invite you to pray aloud with me. Dear God of all grace, please grant us the grace to receive your grace and grant us the grace to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, rest for your souls. Could you use some rest? You're tired, tired. Fatigue is not a foreign word to you. You know well its fruits, the burning eyes, the stiff neck, the weary muscles, the robotic thoughts, the easily irritable person that weariness can turn you into. You're tired. We're tired. We're a tired society. We're a tired generation. We race. We run. We're tired. Have you looked at the faces lately? Have you walked through an airport or through a grocery store? Have you seen the faces made long by the long lists of things to do and the long lists of people to please and the long lists of accomplishments to accomplish. Everything needs attention. The kids do. The carpet does. The canary does. Everything needs attention and everyone wants more. The government wants more taxes. The school wants more homework. The parents want more obedience. The kids want more toys. The spouse wants more attention. The gym wants more workouts. And the church, oh, the church. Have I mentioned the church? More Bible study. More attendance. More prayer. More giving. More hospitality. More more, more. And what do you say in response? They speak for God. Everybody wants more. And we get tired because it seems like every time we turn around, there's a a slave driver, there's a, a taskmaster right over our shoulder, snapping the whip, making demands. More mud, you Hebrew. Let me have a bigger brick for the pyramid. There he is. There's your slave compatriot, your counterpart in ancient history, the slave, the Hebrew slave of Egyptian captivity. You talk about tired. No rest, no break, no coffee time, no vacation, no meaning no purpose, just one brick on top of another brick so that some Pharaoh who has an ego the size of the Nile River can point to a pyramid or point to a city and boast to his little sweet girl friend what he has accomplished when really you know and I know that he never lifted a finger. Tired. You talk about tired. But then God decided otherwise. Look what he said to the weary Hebrews. I am the Lord, he said, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6. He promised, I will rescue and I will redeem. And did he ever? To use the word of the ancients, God smote them good. He subjected Pharaoh and his cronies 
to an onslaught, a house of horrors, water the thickness of blood, hail the size of golf balls, swarms of gnats, and we still talk about the way he opened the Red Sea like you'd open a curtain and the way he closed it like a shark closes his jaws on the Egyptian soldiers. We still talk about what God did to take the Hebrews out of the land of slavery into the land of redemption. He redeemed them out of the land of slavery, the land of wanting more, into the land of no more. No more Pharaoh, no more foreman, no more bricks, no more meaningless labor. It was as if all of heaven shouted to the Hebrews, you can rest now. After 400 years of labor, you can rest now. And they did. Press your ears up against the pages of the book of Exodus and you will hear a collective sigh emerge from a million sets of lungs. <sighs> we can rest now. And they rested. They rested for about two inches. Two inches. That's, that's the amount of space in my Bible between Exodus chapter 15 and Exodus chapter 16. It's really about two months in real time. But during that brief period of white space between Exodus 15 and Exodus 16, during those two months, guess what? The Hebrews decided they didn't want to rest any longer. They decided they wanted to go back to Egypt. They decided they wanted to go back to work. Yes, back to the pyramids, back to the stacking of bricks. Yes, back to the mud, back to the heat, back to the foreman, back to the Pharaoh. They wanted to go back to the old life. They wanted to go back to work. Why? Because they got hungry. They got hungry. And they missed the Egyptian food. It was probably nothing more than bare bone soup, but... Nostalgia is no stickler for details. They thought it was a feast. So they wanted to go back to Egypt. We still read Exodus chapter 16 and we scratch our heads and we think, now why would they want to go back to Egypt? Have they so quickly forgotten? It's only been two months. Two months. Have they so quickly forgotten what the work was like in Egypt? And can they not rest? Can they not trust that God is going to feed them? He brought Pharaoh down. Can he not bring food down? Can they not just rest? Apparently not. Because they told Moses, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back into slavery. So here's what Moses said to them. Moses said to them, did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken a leave of your senses? Wait a second. It's not out of the book of Exodus. That's out of the book of Galatians. Did I just make a mistake? Those aren't the words of Moses. Those are the words of Paul. Those aren't the words spoken in 12th century B.C. Those words were spoken in the first century A.D. How could I mistake the words of Paul for the words of Moses? Am I losing my edge as a Bible teacher? Or could it be that Paul and Moses had a similar challenge and an identical response? You see, back in the days of the Hebrews, they were wanting to go back into slavery under Pharaoh. But in the days of Paul, the Christians were wanting to go back into slavery under the old law. Uh, the, 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 the children of Moses were wanting to work for the Egyptians but the Christians in the first century were wanting to work for their salvation. Both had been redeemed. Both had been rescued. But the drama that redeemed and rescued the children in the days of Paul overshadowed the drama of the days of Moses because when God redeemed the people in the days of Paul, he did so not through Moses, but through Jesus. And not through ten plagues, but through one cross. And he smote, not Pharaoh, but he smote Satan. 
And he opened up not the Red Sea, but he opened up the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And Jesus came marching out across the dry land until he found himself in the land of no mores. And he motioned for anyone who would like to follow him out of the land of slavery to follow him into the land of no mores, no more law, no more hoping you might be saved. No more trying to keep every law, wondering if God is satisfied. It's as if Jesus said to everybody, you can rest now. You can rest now. And guess what? They did. The people rested for about 10 pages, which in my Bible is the distance between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 2 is the sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost in which he announced that we're saved by what Christ did, not by what we do. But by the time you flip the page a few times in your Bible, you find Acts chapter 15. And right in the very presence of the place where the Pentecostal sermon was preached, there's a conference going on of the church leaders that includes the Apostle Paul and several people from the newborn church. And they're discussing this idea of grace. Because some of the people in the church, believe it or not, I'm not making this up, they want to go back into slavery. And they're telling some of the new Christians, yes, Jesus saves you, but he doesn't do everything. He does a lot of it, but not enough of it. And you need to go through some of the law of Moses, circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, and so forth, in order to be saved. These people believed in grace a lot. We call them the grace a lots Because they believed in grace a lot. They believed that when Jesus died on the cross, he did a lot. That he almost did enough, but not quite. He did more than you and I could ever do, but never quite enough. And that the rowboat called salvation has two oars on it. And most of the time, Jesus does all of the rowing. But every so often, he gets a little tired. And he turns the oars over to us to finish what he began. They believe in grace a lot. The Apostle Paul called their beliefs hogwash. Loose translation. He did not believe in grace a lot. He believed in grace alone, alone. And there is a world of difference. He did not want to go back to Egypt. He did not want to go back to the land of work more. He did not want to go back to the land of do more. He was content to have been redeemed and carried into the land of no more. No more, because what Christ did was enough. And he pleaded with the children, the Christians, to set aside the old and to trust the new. To the weary Christians, he said these words. The person who believes God is set right by God. The person who believes God is set right, not by rules, or regulations, but by God. That's the real life. Rule keeping does not naturally evolve into keep living by faith, but it only perpetuates itself in more and more rule keeping. Christ redeemed us from that self defeating, cursed life by absorbing it completely into Himself. Say no to pyramids and bricks. Say no to rules and lists. Say no to slavery and performance. Say no to Egypt. Why? Because Jesus has redeemed you. Can't you just see? I can just see the Apostle Paul's face getting really red. I can see his fists clenching. I can see those blood vessels popping in his neck. He was so passionate about this. Jesus has redeemed you, he would say. Jesus has redeemed you. Do you know what that means? Do you? Do you know what that means? If you don't, I know why you're tired. 
For there is no real rest outside of the land of redemption. If you don't know what it means to be redeemed, listen, you don't need a better bed to get rest. You don't need a better brew or a different boss. You don't need a younger woman or an older scotch. You need redemption. You need to know what it means to stretch yourself out in the hammock called redemption. The Apostle Paul loved to use this word. Always in association with grace. For example, Romans 3. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Where you see grace, you always see redemption because they come at you like tandem fighters. Grace brings redemption because redemption brings grace. A part of the gift of God is redemption. And redemption creates a redeemed people. And where there are redeemed people, there is rest. Because those who are redeemed can rest, and they can rest deeply. There are two words in the New Testament for redemption that are used more than any other. One means ransom, to purchase, to buy back, to satisfy completely the debt, whatever it takes to own that particular person. Often used in the context of buying a person out of slavery or even purchasing a person out of a kidnapping situation. That's the word used in Romans chapter 3. The word that's used by Paul in Galatians is the word that's, it's actually a commercial word more than it is a, a theological word. Long before it was in church circles, it was in market circles because the word Greek agorazo to redeem, it, it, it has within it the word agora, which is the word market. So a redemption is something that happens in the market, in the exchange of goods, a bartering you, you performed redemption decisions this week, didn't you? Did you buy something this week? You, you redeemed a bag of potato chips for $1.99. You, you, you redeemed some gallons of gas for way too much money. You, you redeemed. When you purchase something, you perform an act of redemption. You make a redemption decision. There you were in Best Buy, and you saw that iPod, and you thought, oh, what beautiful music that iPod could bring into your world. And so you thought about how much money's in your bank account. You thought about how much that iPod would cost. You weighed the issues. You realized you would rather have the iPod in your house than you would the money in your bank account. And so you made a redemption decision. You redeemed the iPod. And you took it home and you placed it in the music maker and it began to make music. Why? Because it had been redeemed. It had been redeemed. In view of all the other items in Best Buy, that iPod was happy because it had been selected. It had been purchased. It had reason to make music because you had purchased it. You had declared in front of everybody in a public and legal fashion that you were willing to give up what was in your bank account so this particular item could be in your house. That's why the iPod makes music, because it has been redeemed. That's why you can make music, because you, my friend, have been redeemed. Think what this means. This means that God has decided that life with you in the new kingdom is more valuable to him than blood in the body of his own son. That's how valuable you are to him. That when he looked at you, the God who knows all, considered what life would be like without you in the new kingdom. That's what grace is all about. It's God's way of taking us into the new kingdom. 
When he envisioned life in the new kingdom without you, he thought, I could not have a new kingdom without him, without her. I will do whatever it takes. I will pay whatever the cost to make sure that he or she is in my new kingdom. Listen, he did his due diligence. He is a just God. He knows all. He sees all. He evaluated your life from day of birth to day of death. He saw every moment. He heard every word. He knew every thought from birth to hearse. He saw it all. He could have walked away. He could have said, I don't think so. But he did not. And he paid the necessary price in order to have you in his kingdom. He wants you there. He wants you. Am am I making sense? He wants you there. In a world that continues to tell you you're only as valuable as young as you are or as flat belly as you are or as wrinkle less as you are or as fast as you are or as rich as you are or as whatever as you are that you lose your value the older you get the weaker you get the tireder you get against all of that message that you heard all last week and all of that message you're going to hear all this week it comes at you from all angles in the midst of that is this reassuring voice of invitation of God to rest in which he says the only opinion that matters is mine and I have made my decision." I have redeemed you. I have brought you out of Egypt. I have brought you out of law keeping. I have bought you. It is settled. It is finished. Guess what? You can rest now. You can rest. It's finished. It's done. Folks, I don't know where you find rest if you don't have redemption. I really don't. Because with no redemption, you're always running, trying to prove yourself, trying to impress somebody. And most of all, you're trying to impress God. But the message of redemption says God has already evaluated you and he has paid for you. You can rest now. Maybe it it works to say it like this. You, in God's perspective, in God's economy, you are worth dying for. What do you think of that? You are worth dying for. And your father is very fond of you. I believe that we were made to live with the blessing of a father. I remember when my father passed away back in the mid-1980s. Soon thereafter, I went out to visit my mother in West Texas because my uncle was visiting her from California. My father's name was Jack. My uncle's name was Billy. And Billy looked a lot like Jack, the younger brother version, a smaller version of my father. They talked a lot. They sounded a lot. They just kind of, well, you'd expect it. They were brothers. And so when I saw Uncle Billy, I felt like I was seeing my father, though my father had been gone for a couple of years. Wow, what a great day we had. We laughed and we ate and we talked and we reminisced. And then it came time to go. When it came time to go, my Uncle Billy followed me out into the driveway. And it was just my Uncle Billy and me. He's shorter than I am. And he reached up and he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, Max, I want you to know your dad was very proud of you. I was able to contain the emotion till I got in the car. And then I started to weep. And I was reminded both of the Father's love, but of how deep the Father's love goes. It just goes deep. Maybe you had a father who told you he loved you. Or maybe you did not. But regardless, it's my privilege to be in your life right now an Uncle Billy. 
speaking on behalf of your heavenly Father based on the promises of Scripture that no matter what you have done this week, this decade, this life, no matter what you have done, His word to you is, I love you. I'm proud of you. You can rest now. For of all the things you may need to earn while you're on this earth, earn a degree, earn a salary, earn a promotion, you'll never need to earn your Father's love. You can rest from that. The big thing is done. In redemption, he proves that you can rest deeply. Could I ask you to receive that rest for just a moment? I'd like to ask you to close your eyes and receive these words as spoken by God to you. Please don't resist these. Don't filter these. Don't downplay these. Don't deflect these words. They are for you. God says to you, you can rest now. You are mine. The matter is settled. The decision is made. The purchase is complete. You don't have to earn my favor. You have it. I do not remember the sin that you keep bringing up. It's been dealt with. It's time for you to trust my ability to forgive you. You don't have to get my attention. I know you already. I know you full well. I know you more than you know you. And I have decided and announced for all the universe to hear, I want you in my new kingdom. Nothing else needs to be done. I have swept away your offenses like the morning cloud, your sins in the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. The transaction is sealed. I, God in heaven have made my choice and I choose you before you open your eyes I'd like to give you a word to describe the emotion that those words create the word that describes the emotion those words create is rest that rest that of all the things that are unsettled in this world, the one thing that is settled is God's affection toward you. And of all the things that might change in your future, the one thing that will never change is God's complete, eternal devotion to you. Of that issue, you have no need for concern. You can rest. No more performance, no more clamoring after God, no more striving, no more putting your head on your pillow wondering if you've out your grace. That is not the case. He has redeemed you. Why don't you just stay here? I, I mean, stay here in the land of redemption. You don't have to live, leave it ever. You can stay here. You can raise your kids here in the land of redemption. You can, you can build a career right here in the land of redemption. You can serve God in the land of redemption. You can live in the land of rest. As you open your eyes, here's the invitation from Scripture. There is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that place of rest. There is a place of rest called heaven, but heaven has already begun if you're in Christ. You can enter that place of rest. Ironically, it takes work to enter the place of rest. You've got to focus. You've got to decide. It's one thing to get us out of Egypt. It's another thing to get the Egypt out of us. We had this desire to keep working to please God. But God is pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he loves you. So just stay here in the land of rest. And receive again the promise of Jesus Christ.